Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Abroad podcast, episode five. I've got a guest today with me, Michael Walker Fitton uh, from Spain right now, coming in live. Mike, how are you, mate? Yeah, really good, mate. Really good. How are you good. doing? Yeah, good, mate. Coming out of lockdown, um, I'm still in Venice or just a stone's throw away, and um, but things are getting better. The masks are off and we were down the beach yesterday. So yeah, good times, good times. How's awesome. it in Spain? Yeah, it's actually it's changed. It's getting a lot better now. Um, actually, about three weeks ago, the letters outside and we could start running around again, which was good. After right. being locked up for about two months, with no running, not yeah. much cardio, which when you're playing full time <laughs> is pretty bad um and then today was actually the first time i've been in the gym in three months so pretty big day for me. <laughs> yeah it's good gonna, yeah. gonna be feeling yeah. those doms tomorrow yeah definitely i think it was like five sets of ten squats and lunges not nice nice mate I, well i just i just wanted to give for the uh, listeners a little introduction to you um you're a second row line out specialist 33 years old correct me if i'm wrong yeah, I don't know if you broadcasting that, but yeah. <laughs> um, you're currently playing in Spain with El Salvador. You've been there for uh, five or six years. Yeah, yeah. Or coming into your sixth season, I think. C- and coming into the sixth season, that's right. Which is a bit of a feat in itself, but you must have uh, become somewhat of a club legend out there um, <laughs> in, in, within those six years. But, but yeah, I just wanted to um, go back to how you started your rugby career because I know it's a, a bit of an unorthodox route. I, like me, myself, I started playing rugby when I was eight years old. And when I, when I was about 12 or 13, I knew that it was what, what I wanted to pursue as a, as a sort of professional yeah. career. Um, yeah. But I know just from having spoken to you before that, that it completely wasn't like that for you. Just can you can you just give us a, an overview? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, I know that most guys would start in school or before school, eight years old. But um, I didn't start until I was eighteen. And uh, my school actually it was just a normal school run by the government in the north of England and Burnley. Um, they didn't offer rugby. I think we played one, maybe one tournament of rugby league one year, and that was it. So no rugby union, and then uh, when I went to college, my best mate was playing for a team uh, called Coldervale, which are now called Burnley Rugby Club. And yeah. he said to me, "Look, uh, I'd love you to come down and give it a go and just see how you go." And you were I, I loved you were how old? I was seventeen or eighteen at this point, so it was in college. Yeah, and um, yeah, so I, I went down. I give it a go. I was playing inside centre for my first four games, and then they decided nice. uh, that that probably wasn't the position for me, and they they moved me on into the second row, and I've been there ever since. <laughs> nice mate, and um, so so you picked up your your mate invited you down. And it was just it was just love at first sight. Yeah, I mean, like, I've always loved sports. Um, growing up, I was playing football and cricket and basketball and all, all kinds of stuff, roller hockey. You name it, I probably played it. But, um, you know, rugby was never really one of those options through my teens, and so I never really got into it in school or anything. And then one day, he um, just said to me, come down. You know, I was quite a big lad <laughs> at 17, 18, so it kind of came naturally to me. Yeah, nice, mate. And so the journey started, so to speak, at, at 18. And then how did you, because obviously you moved, ended up abroad. Was that something that you were, yeah. were thinking about doing anyway as part of your sort of growth as, as you, you went, went through, as you got older? Or? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not really sure. It's kind of just um, kind of worked out that way. But what, what, what happened was when I was playing for Burnley, I, I then moved on and played in... Um, in Wharfdale and Preston in the national leagues. And yeah. I was playing, f- and um, one of my coaches was the coach for the, the Sail Sharks 18. Yeah. And then I ended, up, I ended up playing at Sail Sharks when I was 19 until about 21. So and you, then, you don't even, so, sorry to interrupt, you'd only been playing for a couple of years and you were already um, playing in yeah, the A-League. I, I, which is- I mean, but my first A-League, I was 19. So um, I'd only been playing for maybe a year and a half. Yeah. 
But look, when I, when I was 19, I think I was 115 kilos and six foot five. So it's kind of, you know, the second row, you don't need much more than that. Yeah. <laughs> what, you mean, you mean you don't need any skills? Other skills? <laughs> uh, I've, not the start. I mean, I played basketball a lot when I was in college. So, that, so I've had some basic skills and, yeah. you know, picked it up pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and then sorry, just and how did you end up going abroad then? Because okay, yeah. so when I was uh, twenty one, I was playing in the A League for sale each Monday yeah. and training occasionally with them, but not really going anywhere. And I was playing for Preston in National League Two, yeah. and then a club in France in the Federal League. Uh, they they uh, they offered me a contract. I went over and did a trial with them for a few days. And then they offered me a contract. I didn't know anything about the club. I just knew it was France. Yeah. And look, if I'm honest, coming from where I come from and how I grew up and the amount of money that was on the table for you know, a 21-year-old kid yeah. that wasn't really doing much in England, I couldn't turn it down. Uh, cool. And how was that experience in France? Because I know from my own personal experience, it's a very different... Uh, well, g- going into those federal leagues, it's a very different experience to, to yeah. maybe what you're doing now in Spain. Uh, yeah, look... At 21, when I first got there, it was a real eye opener. Um, yeah. Mate, <laughs> it was very physical, yeah. very di- very dirty. Uh, <laughs> there was all sorts going on. I mean, I remember getting out of rooks and I being bitten and, and gouged. Th- these aren't things to joke about, but you know, it's the way rugby was 12 yeah, years yeah. ago. Yeah. And um, but it was a good, it was a good experience. I actually um, I moved there and, and I took my girlfriend at the time with me and my mum as well. Moved the whole yeah. family because you know we didn't have much going on in England. So and I was getting paid well, like I said. So you know, yeah. Nice. So, you saw, so you saw it as like a, a kind of opportunity to to try something new and get away from. Yeah, yeah. For me, France has always been some, somewhere I wanted to to go when I'd start playing rugby and I was watching games and stuff. And growing up. Um, I'd, I'd been to France quite a lot with my family, yeah. you know. So my mum always wanted to live in France. So when this opportunity came, it just it, it was the right time, and I suppose the the right sort of thing for us to do. Great, and obviously it's a, it's kind of different because you'd only been playing rugby for like three three or four years oh, yeah. at that yeah, point. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, what what an amazing opportunity to to pursue kind of a professional career at that point. Yeah, look. It, if, if I'm completely honest about it, the way it came around, um, I think it was inside running. And I, obviously, I played with uh, Sale Sharks. At this point, I probably played like 15, 16 games for them. So I was quite regularly yeah. playing. And I think I'd got an email off inside running and they said that there was opportunities. And so I emailed them back. And that's honestly what it was. You know, it's just a couple of emails and I was on a flight for a trial in France. Amazing, really, how it works like that. And then, so how yeah. long were you in France for? A year or two? Or no, so, so that that, um, that first year I went away, I was only there for one season, okay. and I, I knew nothing about the club. And we ended up getting relegated. It, it wasn't a, a great club. It was only a small <laughs> club. Yeah. Uh, they were good people, and it was it was a good cultural experience. But um, yeah. we didn't do much on the field, unfortunately. Yeah. And then, so so you left that club, presumably yeah. when they got relegated, and, and yeah, come back, to come back home. Yeah, I came back. I came back to England, but I was only back in England for a few months. Really, I was playing again. I'd got back into with Sale, and I'd played a few games for them. And I was playing for a Manchester Rugby Club in National One. And oh, yeah. by I don't know by February, I'd got another offer to go abroad again. So I packed my bags and I headed off to Sydney in Australia. Oh wow! So. <laughs> So you were you were kind of used to the the idea of travelling abroad already, and you just packed yeah. your bags again with with no second thoughts, or was it was it an easy decision that time? Or was no, it, it, was, it was probably hard at that time because I'd, I'd left my my mum back back at home, and I'd, I'd left uh, my girlfriend at the time back back at uh, back at home, back in Burnley yeah. where we were. Um, but when the opportunities came, you know, I, I was young, I wanted to experience a bit of life and, and yeah. get away. And I'm I'm really glad I did it because I yeah. I, I, I had two years in, in Australia and they were honestly the best experience I think I had in rugby. Amazing, yeah. I guess you were at the age. What age were you? Twenty two, twenty three. When when you no, did that? At, that, at that point I was probably twenty three or twenty four. Okay. And I, and I stayed out there for a couple of years. 
so that that's kind of you're you're really experiencing life to the full at that point i mean it's <laughs> it, it just to mention i've mentioned it before but it, it takes some balls to say well i'm leaving so leaving the family back home and if, it, if you're in a serious relationship clearly at the time to to be able to pack your bags and go and have a life experience at that at that point that takes some balls to be able to to be able to do that and it, like you said, it probably wasn't the easiest of decisions, but it's something that you you don't regret at all. Like you, you just said, it that it's probably the best experience you've had with your rugby, and that's a really interesting one because that because that happened after taking that what was probably you said the hardest decision. So yeah, I mean, going going to France originally kind of made sense to me, and then going to Australia was more about was more about me and just enjoying my life. Yeah, so it was, it was a bit more selfish, I guess, in, in that regard, but. I don't know. I really, I really enjoyed it. When I say I enjoyed it, probably the most I enjoyed rugby. It was more of the social side of rugby. And, you know, I was playing for a good club out there. I was playing at Ramwick um, yeah. in their grades. And um, they were a really good bunch of guys. And socially, it was brilliant. Wicked. Yeah. Because um, I know a lot, some of the boys that come over to Spain um, in recent years, a lot of them come from that, that league down in in Australia, and it's, mm. it's a great it's a great level down there, despite it not being completely professional. I think is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think when I got there, they, they gave me um, a job that was through one of the um, the sponsors of the club, and I was yeah. back to working again. And I mean, I was wasn't doing much, you know, I was just uh, cleaning pools and mowing the lawns <laughs> um, nice. in the suburbs in Sydney, but. Um, you know, it allowed me to train and to play and enjoy myself. And really, yeah, it was just okay. an experience. It was, a, it was an experience more about enjoying myself than about the rugby. Yeah, I do. I can compare it with uh, when I was nineteen. I, I was down in New Zealand playing playing in Wellington. I think at probably a similar similar level to that mm. the league down in Sydney. And I was um, again. It was like you say about about the life experience. And I was working in a hotel, making beds and doing room service and stuff. And wow, crazy to think back, but yeah. that, that was probably one of the, one of the coolest rugby experiences I, I've had to date. And yes, you're still in touch with some of those guys that we yeah, about yeah. 10 years yeah. ago now. And um, just some, one of the most amazing experiences. You're on the other side of the world, but you're this thing, rugby is connecting you like and making your life work for you over there even if yeah. whether it was someone getting you a job someone putting you up in their place for a, f- a few weeks or whatever it is guys welcoming you in from from teams that you, where you wouldn't quite you wouldn't imagine who have imagined before I guess when you're 17 and haven't even started playing rugby and now you have an ex- amazing experience it's, it's a cool thing to say to say you've done yeah definitely it, it was really it was, it was great it was a great experience and then, so, and then you did two years in Australia, and then where did you head yeah. next? Um, so, the same guy, and I'm pretty sure it was the same agent that got me to go out to Australia. He was a guy from Ramwick Rugby Club, uh, surprisingly, and he randomly came up to me one day and we said, "Oh, there's an opportunity in uh, Spain to go and play for a club," and I didn't know much about Spanish rugby at the time. Yeah. Um, and then he said to me, look, this club, they've just won the league and they're going to be playing in the European Cup. Um, and so I, I had a look at the club and I, I Googled it and stuff. And when I realized that, you know, they were going to be playing against the top 14 and some premiership sides in the European Cup, I just jumped at the opportunity. Yeah. And so I, I got, I packed my bags again and flew to Spain. <laughs> <laughs> nice, mate. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's that um, sort so, of sorry, availability that, to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I mean the way I was, I was, I was single, and I, I could do what, what I wanted really, and and what I wanted to do at the time, I, and they were going to be paying me, so I didn't need to work anymore. You know, yeah. and after two years in Australia, the visa situation sort of wasn't great, so it, the opportunity came really at the, the right time, and it was it was a good opportunity. Yeah, because, and I guess it, it, was that one more of a move for okay, I might it might put me in the shop window here. It's going to be a good level of rugby if I'm going to be playing in the European Cup, or was it another? Oh, I'm just going for the experience kind of thing. No, I, I, I genuinely started to think that if I had some good games in the European Cup, that maybe I could get something back at, back in England in, in a decent team, or or maybe in France as well. Yeah. And um, really, I, I, like, I like the challenge of thinking that, you know, I get to go up against some top 14 sides or, and it was Sale Sharks in the Premiership, which was cool. Yeah, um, you old boys. Yeah, which was great. It was great. Yeah. It was actually, um, I organised the night out for us after the away 
game in Manchester in one oh, of their right. clubs in the city centre, which is brilliant. The boys loved it, and all the Spanish boys. I it's good, it's going it's good fun. Yeah. Letting their hair down. Yeah. Um, nice, mate. And, and did, did you get what you wanted out of that then? Did anyone pick you up uh, yeah. like, from other so, clubs? So, how it worked out, um, actually, we didn't do too badly in the European Cup. We had some good games and we competed reasonably. But um, best, best result? In the group, what was it? Oh, it was breathe away, and it was something like thirty-three seventeen, which was oh. a lot better than some of the other ones. I can tell you. I, <laughs> I think when we played, it. we played Sale at home, and, and at half time we were only down by one try. And at the end of the game, it was something like sixty-two seventeen or something like that. You know, which was it, it was a there's a massive difference. Did they, did they bring the big boys on after half time? No, no, it was, it was more just you know you can't keep competing with these guys and uh, I can't remember the, the players there's a lot of international players playing for these sides and we, yeah. we couldn't com- we couldn't compete we didn't have the level to compete with these guys not not to to a certain extent but you know we, we did it well we, we fought hard that was an experience yeah the thing with the club which was La, La Villa in Alicante yeah um, was after, after the European Cup ended the uh, local council withdrew some of the funding and okay. so basi- basically by the end of the, the season there's still something like two months to go and, and the club had um, the club had, had didn't have any money and they couldn't pay the players so some yeah. players were leaving some players were staying and the, the season ended quite quite negatively really but yeah. I, I ended up staying to finish off the season with them but at the, at the end it wasn't really what I sort of went for and what I expected yeah but you got you had that cool European experience, which I guess was really yeah. awesome. Yeah, and, it was um, brilliant. And then from then, like, did did you move on from Spain after that finishing that season with them? Yeah. So um, after after I left La Villa, I'd gone back home for the summer, and yeah. I, was, I was speaking to agents and a couple of different agents. At this point, were talking to me because uh, one thing I had done, I'd, having played in the European Cup, was I put some highlights together on video just of the European Cup games. Yeah. Um, which were pretty much almost all sort of tackling guys and like winning lineouts. But the um, yeah, I, I had a bit of interest in France. So there was a club called Chateau Renard in Avignon in France, and they got in touch and they offered me a contract. Um, they actually offered me and our number eight South African guy called Jared Ells yeah. the two of his contracts to go out and play for them for the for the season. And so we both, we talked to each other and we agreed to go out and they were in France. Back to France. <laughs> Back to France. Was it yeah. a better experience the second time or the first time? Because I know obviously it was, it was probably fresher the first time and that, that you can't beat that kind of like first experience abroad. But yeah. when you went back, was it, this, was it a similar vibe? Was- I, would, I would say when I went back, it was completely different for me because I was living with this guy instead of living with my mum and my girlfriend and I wasn't 21 anymore I was now 26 or something like that and uh, the rugby was pretty much similar to what it was when I was 21 in terms of it was tough and it was was really physical and you know there wasn't much um, rugby being played it was more just scrums and and mauls and the the occasional punch up but um, oh you love that (laughs) Well, the scrums in the malls are all right, aren't they? But <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it was good. Um, the funny thing is, the exact same thing happened. They came down to the last, uh, the last uh, day of the season, and we could have stayed up or we could have gone down, and we had an away game. And yeah. in France, you do not win your away games very often. No, and we ended, we, we ended up get we ended up losing this game, and we got relegated, and it was it was pretty pretty miserable, really, to finish off the season. Yeah. <laughs> So it was time to move on again, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, mate, that's it. Honestly, that's really... at this point, I've had more uh, clubs than Tiger Woods. But <laughs> never mind. That's all right, yeah. Oh, mate, that's that, makes, that makes two of us. No, um, so, no, it's an interesting one because, like, like you say, you've, you, fit, you, you only started playing when you were 17, 18, and you've had 12 years as a professional since you were 21. But and how, many, how many of those years... Have you been abroad? Um, I've been abroad, all of them, except for two, which are the next two years after that last experience in France. Um, so you were back home. Where were you playing? Yes. Yeah, so um, a well-known agent 
um, which I'm pretty sure is your agent, actually got in touch with me. And um, he had a couple of offers for me, and one of them was Doncaster Knights. Yeah. And Doncaster Doncaster's a, a really big club in the north of England, and it was close to home. Um, yeah. It's only an hour's drive away back to Burnley. And right. so I, jump, I jumped at the opportunity to go and play for them. And nice. Yeah. It was, uh, it was actually worked out quite well to, to get that deal straight from France. And, and how long did you stick around back home for? It was just two years, like you said, and then you were off again. Yeah, well, what happened, at Doncaster played the first half of the season. I think it was something like 19 games in a row. I started nearly all of them, and then I tore my calf. Yeah. I had a six centimetre tear, which is pretty bad. And after about three or four months of um, physio, I, I tried to come back and I played one game in the first half. I had to retour it again. Yeah, that's a nightmare. And, yeah, which was a nightmare. And at the end of the season, um, I think Doncaster were um, in an R ring whether to keep me or not. And then I had a solid offer from Ealing Trailfinders yeah. in London, which looking back on it financially it was a better offer than than Doncaster but it would have probably it would have probably been wiser for me to have stayed in in the north if I could have done and taken less money with hindsight but, so with hindsight, hindsight it's a wonderful yeah, thing exactly uh, but anyway I, I, I moved over to Ealing in Ealing Trail Finders and had a year there which is pretty good I had quite a few games for them yeah um, and this was National 1 uh, the year we won National 1 and went up to the championship yeah. Was the obviously the goal then is are you thinking about okay maybe I, I can make a step up to the championship then it's uh... yeah I mean at, at that point well when I, when I was at Doncaster I, I felt quite quite good for the level and I, and I thought I probably could have done a little bit in the championship and and then when I actually signed for Ealing. Uh, Doncaster hadn't been promoted yet and Ealing was still in the championship and there was a day the last day of the season it's, it's quite a funny story looking back in hindsight but Mate, on the last day go on you've got, you've got a few stories where the, the last day of the season is absolutely key eh? oh. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's been a few there's been a few good ones as well as, as you know but yeah, um, yeah the, the, some of them going through are pretty average so I was at Doncaster and I was obviously I was injured and I and I'd already signed for Ealing, who were in the championship. And all they had to do, I think it was um Jersey were playing away at Bedford. Jersey hadn't won an away game the whole season. Yeah. And if Jersey didn't get four points from the game, then Ealing would have stayed up and I I would have been playing in the championship and obviously I'd already signed my contract. And at this yeah. point Doncaster hadn't actually been promoted. Um anyway, it came to the last day game of the season and Doncaster win the game which was great they got promoted which was the goal yeah. that was brilliant um, and then Ealing I think Ealing lost to Rotherham at home yeah. and then Jersey beat Bedford away <laughs> and Ealing went down and honestly like I don't know how it happened but they went down to National 1 which was terrible for the club but obviously it only lasted one year and they got uh, straight back into the championship and now we're flying high yeah yeah yeah, totally. But same story that last day of the season, just not yeah. giving you, giving you what you wanted there. So, yeah. so I guess that that's quite a tough tough one to take. Um, did that like spoke, Did that make you think again about like looking at other options? Because obviously, yeah. maybe it, I know I know me I, in my head, I'd be like, well, something's going on here. Maybe it's just not meant to be at this in like back home or in England or whatever. Yeah. Um, did you did you feel like that, or was it just like I oh, just see what comes up, speak to agents again, or did you did you like purpose purposely look to go abroad again like, this time after that? Um, what actually happened was, uh, Ealing, had, Ealing had said that, that there was a possibly a contract on the table. And they ended up signing some guy from the Premiership that come down, which is fair enough. That's you know every club needs to look after themselves and get the best players that they can get. Sure. Um, which is completely understandable. A couple of weeks before that, I'd said no to Cornish Pirates because I, th- I thought I was going to be staying with Reeling. Yeah. And that had fallen through two weeks later when I actually needed it. So that right. didn't work out. So then I'm I'm sort of scrambling around trying to get something to keep keep playing. Like I, I wanted to keep playing as a professional. Yeah. And like I felt like I had the level. Um, and then I put some feelers out and the same agent that got me Doncaster and Ealing um, said how do you feel about moving abroad 
he'd obviously run out of resources in England. <laughs> Um, how, how do you feel about uh, moving abroad? I said, yeah, I'd be up for it. I've had quite a few good experiences abroad, having been in France and Spain and, and stuff. And I, I'm sort of open minded to go away. And so um, he came back with El Salvador, which is where obviously where I met you. Yeah. And I remembered them from the from the year when I'd been playing for La Villa. We'd played El Salvador maybe five times in a few cup finals and a couple of times in the league. Yeah. And um, so I knew it was a good club. And I knew what they were about, and I knew a couple of the players. And one of the players, John Mayer, he messaged me. Yeah, our big uh, Samoan international number eight. Yeah, and he was he was a great guy, and a guy who'd gone really well with um, when I played at La Villa. And when he messaged yeah. me, and he said, "You know, this is what we're doing. You should come out, and you'd, you'd really enjoy it." I I I jumped at the chance. Yeah, and I'm on the plane again. <laughs> unreal, unreal. No, it's a, it's a it's a good thing to to say that you had someone there who sort of dropped you the line about how good it is here, this is what we've got, this is what this is what we're looking to do, rather, rather than it just being through an agent or just being through like a, a coach trying to convince you or whatever. Similar story to how I ended up going out to Spain. I had um, a couple of guys there, um, Johnny Carter and Tom Pitt, yeah, who... Yeah. who um, Very good guys. <laughs> yeah, who... who Get, dropped me a line and sort of said it, like the opportunity I knew it was there but probably a bit like you the first time you went out to Spain I didn't know anything about Spanish rugby I didn't think there was any any rugby out in Spain let alone some some sort of great crowds good matches good in like intense level of rugby yeah. um, and when they get, gave me the call I and actually spoke to me about it guys that I played with before and appreciated their level as well that's mm. it, that does I think way more to convince you of of an opportunity abroad than than maybe just an agent saying to you yeah look there's this thing abroad and if you want to go I think it's way hard way easier it makes your decision to go way easier if you know someone that's either been there before or or knows a bit about the place like you say Joe did for you yeah yeah definitely I completely agree uh, I mean without Joe Having having told me what the club was about and what they were trying to do that next season, yeah, I don't I don't think I would have I don't think I would have been so eager to join the club as I was, yeah. But um, yeah. So when I when I'd sp- spoken to him, I just decided, yeah, this is what I'm going to do, and I uh, got in the back and I got in my Land Rover, and I just at that point I had um, a little puppy, as you remember, <laughs> and drove I drove everything down to Spain. <laughs> Amazing, mate, and and yeah. happy ever after, is it? If I, more or less, more or less. I mean, we've, I've been here now for five seasons, and I think from the five seasons, the, the major finals we've been in all but one. So the club's done really well, and we've we've won a lot of trophies. We've won whilst I've been here, I think we've won all the trophies you, you can win in Spain. I yeah. think there's four trophies in it. It's the, it's the league. It's the the King's Cup, the Copa del Rey. There's the Super Cup, which is the champions of both, and there's the Iberian Cup, which is the champions against the champions of Portugal, and we've managed to get all four of them. Amazing! And it was that first year that you came out to Spain. That was my second year there. That we yeah. we had an amazing year that year and, and did the double. And <laughs> and it was something that I was just I would never have expected to play that match we played in the, the King's Cup final in front of twenty five thousand people and I know I know you were speaking about that the the best rugby experiences and we both sort of said maybe New Zealand and Australia were those amazing rugby experiences but for yeah. for an individual match that I've been involved in I've got I, I can only point to that match and say that was the best thing I think I've ever done in rugby in my life was that was that King's Cup final with the and uh, getting the getting the medals off, off the king himself of Spain yeah. after that. What about that? On, on, honestly, mate, um, obviously in Australia I enjoyed it and it was more about what I was doing off the pitch and, in, and just enjoying life in general yeah. and sort of lifestyle that was going on. But in terms of actually on the pitch and enjoying um, a moment, I think the King's Cup final, as you say, there was... 25,000 or more the, you know the stadium was full it was brilliant and the yeah. king himself giving us the medals and stuff and then the parties afterwards in the uh, the town square and then around the, uh, the the rugby bar that we got there yeah. just inc- incredible scenes special special times and, it, and it, like, it was really great yeah yeah I guess more special because it was so unexpected like I think in Spain it was the first time that they'd they'd done a major final in such a big stadium and in, in allowed for so many 
people and there was such a big interest because it happened to be a, a derby a derby match which which there was a there's a hist- historic rivalry there and it just meant something for, for me coming from and for you obviously both being english boys it's not something you'd ever expect to find in in spain the unit like we know spain growing no. up as a, as a football nation like um I, i'd never have thought of um passionate fans bit like that kind of rivalry and and the interest that that there was in that in that final but yeah look if, 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 if I'm brutally honest when I when I come from playing in Ealing in England and I thought that was a great level you know yeah. we were playing in front of about 300 people um and they don't have any stands or anything uh, not that, that that's what rugby's all about but in terms of experience and atmosphere and you know yeah. it meaning something to people yeah um coming to Spain and playing in the local derbies here against um the other team Varak um you know this Every time we have a derby, there's at least 5,000 people there, just in a yeah. standard league derby. And you come to the finals and there's at least 10,000 people if we play in our home stadium. Or there's been three or four big finals that they've put on in football stadiums. Since yeah. since you've left, we've played in Valencia. And actually, no, you played in Valencia, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I was yeah, you came back. back. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and then that year, we also played the, the final in Jose Zeria, the football stadium again. But with a, a few less people because they only had six days to organise it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of experiences, Spain's been unreal on the pitch, and also off the pitch, it's been really great as well. It's, I've been a lot more settled here. Yeah, well, you, clearly you have. You've been there for five years, and obviously that yeah. means you, you found some kind of uh, happiness there. And um, uh, what about the language? How's that been? Yeah. Uh, obviously, when you were here, I didn't speak more than about four or five words. But yeah, I was, um, I was a bit worried because you'd, you'd spent that year in uh, in La Vila, and maybe you'd turn yeah. up to El Salvador that year with a bit of <laughs> French Spanish like mixture. It was good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'd learn a bit. Of, I'd obviously learn a bit of French when I was living the second time in France. Yeah. Um, and then over this course of five years, I picked up I would say say quite a reasonable amount of Spanish, and this this. Last two years, I'm actually doing some studying online, doing a yeah. degree, um, and one of the courses at the side of that is in Spanish. Oh, great! I picked up my level B one in Spanish this year, and then next year I'm doing my level B two. So, you know, like that, that would allow you to be a teacher in Spanish. Oh, that's awesome, mate! Which is quite it's quite cool to do at the side of, of rugby. Yeah, so you're you're 33. What does the future hold, rugby-wise? That's the that's always the question, isn't it? Um, in terms of now, I'm doing a bit of coaching with the forwards in my club, um, which is which is good, um, and I'm enjoying that a lot. And I've done a few courses and stuff. Um, is that something you knew knew you wanted to get into before? Or did you do it just natural? I mean, it, it's it's naturally come about because of the way I've been as a player with the lineups and stuff, and you know, having a certain amount of knowledge. Yeah, um, it's sort of it's been a natural process. Um, I mean, I've been calling lineouts for about ten years, and yeah. I've developed a, a considerable knowledge during that ten years enough to be able to coach. Um, and so I've, I've done a few courses, and I think you know that's one option to do. Another option, yeah. of course, is the degree I'm doing in um, is a sports science degree with um, courses as well in Spanish. So awesome. may, maybe going down that route, but. Who knows what the future holds? At the moment, I'm just concentrating on rugby. Uh, I've got a few more years left in me. Yeah, awesome. Especially after this lockdown, three, three months of no rugby. Probably going to be six months by the end of it. It's doing me here with the world of good. Yeah, I imagine that, that extra rest, body probably needs it after the non-stop, non-stop yeah. rugby season. Yeah, well, um, as you well know, rugby's quite tough and the way it's been the last few years, especially playing with Spain, um, the last few seasons I've, I've played 34, 35 games a year. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, something, something I hadn't mentioned was that in your five years now in Spain, you've actually reached the level of being, becoming an international with, with Spain, which is unbelievable. Um, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable achievement. I imagine an amazing feeling as well, having having settled as well in, in Valladolid, um, the yeah. city where you are. I, I guess then sort of being able to give back on an international level, um, I guess that's a, a great thing. Do you see it like that as a way yeah, of, a way of giving yeah, back? Yeah, I don't know if it's giving back, but um, 
I guess in in some ways it is. You know, I'm representing the club. I'm representing the country, and I, I try to do my best. And every time I play for them, yeah. And I think I've played something like twelve games now um, over the last year and a half. Well, mate, uh, they've been on that. I think their best run in their history in in that time, haven't they? In the last year or so. Yeah, so last year we only lost one of the 10 test matches we played and we ended up beating, I think it was three of the World Cup teams that played um, in the last World Cup. Who were those teams? Uh, we beat Uruguay, we beat Romania, we beat Russia, uh, we beat Russia again this season. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know uh, Romania didn't go to the World Cup, did they? But yeah. they were that sort of level they were trying to aspire to be. I found it quite interesting that um, I've, in the past, maybe the Spain team has been quite full of guys from from the French leagues. And I know in the last year and a half or so, looking at their squads that they're putting together, they're, they're involving a lot more guys from from the Spanish leagues, which which I think it says a lot about how far how the level of the Spanish leagues have, has in, improved over time. But yeah. also, also, I just think it's, it's interesting to see that they're getting possibly better results from having guys that uh, more or a majority of guys uh, that are playing in the Spanish leagues and then bringing in sort of a minority of guys from a higher level over in France maybe and that yeah. mixture is working better than maybe just bringing the whole a whole lot of guys with Spanish grandparents or whatever it is from yeah. France like, did, did you get that feeling yeah, what, what I would say is when I started playing for Spain it was November of 2018 and they were now out of the World Cup they couldn't qualify and okay. so I think a lot, a lot of the French guys had, had been in that qualifying process and a yeah. lot of them had been been quite tired of, of you know they'd put a lot out there to try and qualify for the World Cup and they probably they'd done it on the pitch um, I know that ended badly with that whole uh, match against Belgium with, with that batch of French players they were probably tired at the time you know they needed a rest from international rugby and it allowed the guys that had been playing in Spain and I suppose the, the coach of Spain to let a few guys that, have been, that are playing in Spain opportunities to play, like myself, like a lot of the young Spanish guys, especially we've got a few of them in, in, in my, my club here in Spain. Yeah. Um, and what I would say is that the level of club rugby in Spain has, in the last five years has gone up dramatically with more clubs becoming more professionalised. Um, yeah. When I first came here, there was only maybe really two or three clubs that were sort of trying to push towards professional rugby. And now of the 12 clubs this last season, there was probably at least 10 of them that are really pushing for a, to be as professional as they can be with teams wow. having gone full time. That's amazing. Do you think yeah. um, that's going to take a hit with the current situation with the whole, with the virus situation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah brutally honest. Yeah. I, I would, um, I would imagine it would, it would take a considerable hit with the, the virus and how many professionals you can have. But the Spanish guys that are here that aren't professionals, they've got the level now to be playing yeah. on the national team. Um, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of young, you know, the guys that are like 19, 20, 21, that have a really, really good level and are getting opportunities in France. Yeah. Is, is there a risk with that for the Spanish league, do you reckon, where, where young guys maybe with with some great potential are, are just being sort of taken away from Spain and straight sucked up by the, the French system, I guess? Yeah, but, but, but I, I think the guys that go, go to bet themselves to develop quicker because yeah. the, the clubs in, in Spain, obviously a lot of them aren't professional or the ones that are pushing towards professionalisation aren't at the same level as maybe some pro D2 or top 14 clubs that have um, academies yeah. and a lot, of, a lot of these guys are going to play in the academies but what's happening with a few of them I know you had Tommy on the other day and there's a, a few more guys that have, have gone to go play for the academies and then been so good or been playing well enough to actually play in the first team straight away yeah. you know at 19 years old which is great yeah so I, that says a lot again about about what Spanish rugby is doing in their youth system to bring these great players to a level by the time they're 19 to be able to play Pro D2 in France so yeah. it, it does say a lot but um, yeah so so the idea is um, continue on with your coaching yeah I'm going to continue coaching I want to keep playing as long as I can do with, with Spain and with my club El Salvador yeah. because I, I can't think of anything better because honestly I love it 
Yeah. You know, the live, the live, you know how it is in Vidalid. The weather's always nice. Right now it's 30 degrees outside. Wow. Um, the pools are opening again next week, which is good. Nice. Um, I wanted to ask you if you would have any advice for guys maybe in a situation where they're umming and ahhing about, uh, I'm looking for that first professional contract in the, in England or wherever they are, or they're trying to jump up to a high level. Um, and something's just not quite, not quite, um, going into place for them. And they're, they might have a thought or it might just spark an idea of going abroad. What would your advice be in that situation? I would just say that, you know, there are more opportunities than just England. Um, in England, it's a bit of a um, sort of closed circle. You know, if you want to play professional rugby, if you're not in an academy, uh, you probably won't play in the premiership. It's just that's the way it is. Yeah. And if you develop later, you might go into the championship, but, you know, it's difficult to make a real living with the sort yeah. of money that, that's on offer. There are opportunities in other countries, France and, and Spain and Italy. Our best experiences as a life sort of experience was going away to the Southern Hemisphere and playing in Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. There are other opportunities out there. You know, don't don't just be focused on just England. Yeah, and and I think like you were saying, it's, it's more than just a rugby opportunity. When you're going to Southern Hemisphere, you're going to other countries, you're getting a whole whole cultural experience um, along yeah, with de- it. Definitely. Definitely. And that's sort of one of the things that makes you enjoy your life, isn't it? It's not all about what happens on the 80 minutes while you're on the pitch, but, you know, the rest of the seven days a week, you're you're living in a country and enjoying it or not enjoying it. But it's all about life experience. Do you do you think um, you see yourself going back home anytime in the future to to England or are you are you Spanish for life now? (laughs) Spanish for life. Um, (laughs) Hashtag. Uh, hashtag for life. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm enjoying Spain. Uh, there's no reason for me to go home at the moment, um, especially whilst I'm playing with my club and playing for the national team. I can't really see a, a need to go home. What, one thing I would like to do uh, after I finish this degree is do a master's in something. So maybe that might mean me going back to do a year, doing a master's in one of the universities back home. Awesome. But other than that. I am enjoying my life in Spain. Awesome, mate. Great to hear. Listen, mate, awesome. I, I chose episode five because you wear the number five proudly on your back um, yeah. so often, even if you, you wanted to be a, an inside centre when you first started out. Um, no, but it's been a great chat. I really appreciate your, your insight uh, into life abroad. You've, you've had more more experienced than even myself abroad. I mean, 10 years out of 12 of your professional career, that's an amazing feat in itself. So, mate, um, and being a Spanish international to, to top it off with, with like you say, a, few, a good few years left of your career, I mean, you've clearly only gone from strength to strength uh, in, your, in your career away from home. And, uh, mate, great to have you on and to chat, and hopefully I can have you back some point and we'll, we'll get... Choose a choose a topic of choice and, and really get get stuck into it. Get stuck into it. It's great to catch up, Sam. Mate, thanks for your time, and we'll speak soon, dude. Take care. See you later, buddy. Cheers, man. You can subscribe to the podcast at rugbyabroad.com. Thanks for listening in, and I hope you join me for the journey. <laughs>